Bookcase TV is brought to you in part by Digital Film Academy. Last week we talked about uh, male thriller writer and so how they managed to retain their sanity and how the genre itself was conducive to that. This week we're going to take a look at female writers, thriller, crime writer. Back in the day there were very few women writers, but today they come to dominate quite a few genres, especially in the romance domain and erotica, and thriller is a big turf for women, even though the things are way more nuanced. Uh, so we're going to take a look at this uh, crime writer and see what kind of women they are. To find out, we've dispatched our most faithful investigator, who is going to help us answer those questions. Let's talk about uh, first your work, yeah. uh, because you are a lawyer by trade, correct? Correct. And you did not uh, start writing before a few years ago. Right. I um, started writing after law school. After law school? Yep. Okay. So which was two years Just, ago? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, that was a fair amount of time ago, but I realized there's it, 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 it's the writing is a little restrictive in the law. There's you know there are definitely rules to follow, and so I wanted to something just to write something more creative, and I just decided to write a novel. A novel. Which Ignorance was? is Bliss. No. I wrote a novel called Burning the Map about a woman who goes to Rome and Greece after she takes the bar exam, and the vacation changes her whole life. Okay, something good happened, something bad happened. Because I think I kind of wanted my whole... She, well, you know what, it's always a piece of us in our writing, isn't right. it? Right. A friend of mine is a criminal defense lawyer. She loves being a lawyer, by the way. She ran into a gentleman, a young man in a county jail, and she said, you look familiar. And he said, well, I've been here for six years waiting for a trial. Six years. She couldn't believe it. She checked up on it. It was true. He had been charged with the capital murder when we still had the death penalty. And um, she said, this is, this is insane. So she took the case on pro bono. I got different answers from different people on why he had been in there. But it was basically just a series of, you know, so unfortunate. It's not like no one knew he was there. No one knew, but he was just uh, going on and on and on and on. Well, and then you decided to take a case on? She told me about it. I called her. I have a book called The Rome Affair. And I had a, um, it's about a trip to Italy that leads to blackmail and murder. And I have this married couple in a police, uh, you know, in police custody, and they have them down the hallway from each other, and they're trying to get them to. One to say, you know what your husband's saying? They're trying to get them to falsely confess. So I called her for a research question, and she told me about him. And next thing and, I knew, and I was just, and yeah. now you have a, an organization that takes care of those cases. Correct. Well, that's early part. Now, right. Where are you now? Well, now because I'm writing about a sassy, redheaded lawyer from Chicago, whose name is Izzy McNeil. Izzy McNeil, yeah. And she moonlights as a private detective. Okay. In situations where this private detective needs a woman, he and maybe often needs like a North Side woman to go to this gym or to go to a playground. So. I've never done that. I, I've I've gone. Well, say you. You won't say on the camera. Right. <laughs> correct. I've gone on like stakeouts with private investigators, and it's, it's really tedious. But what's false impression? What's uh, the the, show, the log line for the? False impressions is set in the art world. So it's about an art gallery owner who realizes that she's been selling forged paintings, but when she purchased them or when she got them, they weren't fakes. Mm. So Izzy goes sort of uh, behind the scenes, so to speak, as the gallery assistant and works there to try to figure out. And she's also being stalked, so it's kind of a, uh, there's a, not quite a, a murder mystery, mm. but it's, uh, hmm, I wonder how we would call it. It's more uh, that this woman could be murdered. Okay. So. What's your writing process? Do you investigate, uh, do you go to places, first of all? Do you do a lot of research or you take from uh, the your own experience? The research for False Impressions was really fun because I got, I just went to, it, it's interesting I think being a novelist because people who wouldn't really talk to you about their life all of a sudden do. Are you on a contract? You have to uh, book a year? Yeah. I was doing, t I don't know how I did this. 
I did two books a year for the last four years, which exactly yeah, it's, it's was the amount work. of time it's that I was work. doing Life After Innocence. Yeah. And you're still in the, in the teaching mm -hmm. and the organization. Is, uh, yeah. Right. Um, what, what sort of story do you find attracted to? Well, right now I'm I'm just want I love memoir. I'm just reading everything I can get my memoir hands people, on. Memoir people, memoir famous people. I anyone. Okay. I, although I'm going to get David Sedaris, I guess he's a famous person now. Um, no, I'm talking more like a Kennedy or. Yeah. Uh, I mean. And I'm also reading Colin McCann's uh, Transatlantic right now. And uh, what's next then for you? I'm actually. I got, About for memoir, I, maybe you're going to write your own I'm memoir. I'm actually or taking it. A break. I'm taking it down, and I'm writing women's Does your fiction. Publisher know that? The publisher has asked me to write, go I, in my early days, I wrote more women's fiction, just mm -hmm. so, and I got a dog last year, and I'm, I'm completely obsessed with the dog. And so, what kind of dog is it? A mini golden doodle. Okay, oh. golden doodle, charming dog, They're easy. I'm calling it tentatively, I'd rather sleep with the dog. Okay. Next May 2014, the book will be out, and it's about a joint couple who shares custody of the dog that they got to keep them together. And the dog is in a video that goes viral and it just sends them into chaos. Does everyone know that the hat makes a man? So since we're talking about women theater writers, this uh, hat makes a woman as well. So we are back on Bookcase TV. My second guest of the day is Meg Gardner. And there's a new book, The Shadow Tracer. So uh, last time you and I met, you were working on, the, we were just finishing working on a little blurb for a book to die for. Yes. And you were talking about your uh, love affair with uh, Sue Grafton. Yes, she's yes. uh, the Is it still ongoing? Of course it is. She's uh, <laughs> one of the people that uh, convinced me that I should try to write right. mysteries, thrillers, suspense uh, fiction, so always. So Shadow Tracer is out, been out for, uh, let me show to the camera again, a yes. couple of weeks. Yep, it's about a woman who is a skip tracer. Mm -hmm. She finds people who are trying to hide from arrest warrants or subpoenas or the repo man, and it's her job to find out where they're hiding so she can help the police bring them in or serve a subpoena. She's the one who ends up going on the run herself okay. when a secret is exposed, and she goes on the run with her five-year-old daughter. The question is, of course, whether she can use her, her meager funds and all her wits and her skip tracing skills to try to go off the grid herself and disappear and keep her daughter safe. And so it takes off on a chase across the southwest of the United States. Why, why that choice of job? It's a pretty uh, daring one, I would say, no? Especially when you have a young daughter. A young daughter. Yeah. In the book, Sarah uh, turns out that she had tried she's to gain hero, these skills. Yeah. She, she's the hero. She tried to gain these skills about how to disappear, uh, how to learn how to, how to find people so that she could know how to disappear because she's been fearful since the day that Zoe was born that somebody's going to come after her. So she needed to know how to disappear. We have now our cell phones have GPS and they, they tell That's everybody right. where they can tell everybody where we are all the time. Our credit card records tell everybody where our purchases have been made yes. and so can can be a trail of breadcrumbs. And the easy pass on your car. The easy pass on your car is especially good. So the question is now in a hyper connected, hyper technological world, how do you actually just make yourself become Invisible. invisible. And then you think there's uh, a threat to the individuals by being monitored and recorded. It, does it do something funny to our psyche or our sense of paranoia? I think absolutely it will do something to our sense of paranoia. I think uh, we have relinquished our exp expectation of privacy pretty willingly. Yes. When I was researching the book, I bought a couple of uh, of texts online about skip tracing. And the very first thing that happened when I p pushed buy was that a dialog box popped up that said, do you want to share with all your social networks that you purchased how to disappear? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the presumption was, of course, that we share everything okay. all the time. And that affects, um, that actually affects legal standards uh, as far as your ability to say that you, you want to keep something private. If, if the public standard is, well, everybody shares all of this stuff all the time, then the court can say, no, it, it's yeah. not private. I, I still like the ability to say, please leave me alone. So how do you find your stories? When I find something that keeps me up at night, okay. wonder, worrying about it in the real world, something that just that just gnaws at me, and something that I, I can like, tell to somebody else, and they'll go, "Oh, <laughs> I never thought about that." That's when I think it's a mm. it's a story. 
There was a seminar here yesterday about uh, plotters and pencils. Right. And I didn't know that word existed until yesterday because I would, I would call it a different word. <laughs> Where do you find yourself in that uh, two categories? I plot out my books. You plot out. I, I outline them. Every book because when I, when I didn't, I, I made such a mess of it that you know I ended up with a up a creek without a paddle and couldn't get my way back out. So I have to know where the, at least the beginning, the middle, and the end of a story. And uh, then the rest of it comes alive on the page, but just wandering around, uh, I don't get anywhere good. What's your timeline? I mean, from the time you get the ideas and then moving is pretty quick once you have the ideas, or is a uh, lot of research in between? I can write a, write a book, I hope, in a year. What keeps you writing? What keeps me writing is the fact that it's an amazing job that I can convince people that the stuff I make up in my own head yeah. <laughs> is worth them spending hours or days and, and their money or their time in a library uh, to convince themselves that, that this world is actually real. I think that's just the most amazing job that anybody could ever have. So what's next? After Shadow Tracer. After Shadow Tracer, another thriller, which will be out in 2014. Okay, you're and working on it already? I'm or? working on it, and I will... You're researching, escaping, the writing? Well, I've been doing some <laughs> research here in, in, in New York. <laughs> and uh, uh, So I'll keep you in suspense, that's all I'm going to say. Hey there, partner. Your new book, Let the Dead Sleep. Let the dead sleep. Mm -hmm. So what's to let the dead sleep when they're already sleeping? <laughs> right? They're already well, dead. Well, the concept so with this is, of course, one never oh, knows. That's right. <laughs> it's basically um, an interesting, I mean, I hope an interesting concept about a young man who's super popular, everything is going well in life so well that he um, becomes a drug addict, alcoholic, and dies, um, but however is resuscitated and becomes, uh, first becomes a cop, trying to help others. When you and say then he's in a coma, he's actually dying and he's being uh, magically... He flatlines. Oh, he flatlines flat okay, for sorry. about six minutes and is All brought right. back to life. And once he comes back to life, he's not sure if something has joined him coming back to life, but things change. He sees a mysterious stranger now and then, but that's not really in the first book. And he meets up with a young woman whose dad has owned a shop in New Orleans, which he always thought of as a curio shop and then finds out that he keeps many other things in this curio shop and that he's a collector of objects around the world. And the two of them have to come together to find a bust which seems to be causing problems. Tell me, uh, what's your writing process? Because you write through a lot, I mean like uh, two or three novels a year. So uh, the discipline must be, uh, you must be disciplined obviously. I do you write in the morning, at night, uh, you 20 pages a day? You, do you have a quota? How does that work? Um, I, I kind of know when my deadline is. Okay. Um, having five kids, I always wrote around, you know, what someone was doing with their schedules. And I think they were incredibly good for me because um, I, I feel like I am a Dr. Seuss novel. Like I can, I can write in a plane on a train, oh, <laughs> you yeah. know, going far, far and wide. You know, I mean, it's just yeah. kind of, I, I've gotten to where they, I never needed a quiet place. I never needed a certain place. You know, you go where they are. Yeah, you can write where um, they are. Yeah. yeah. It's so a paper, so you need. Really. There's no noise that bothers me. There's no place that I can't. You can write in chaos, yeah. basically. Did you have any predisposition to the sort of life you were going to have, or you were new in your somewhere in your no, the back <laughs> drawer of your mind that uh, there was a writer sleeping there? No, back in school, I definitely where, where, wanted to be. Where were you like back then? <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to be, um, I was mad about Shakespeare, was really hoping to be with the Shakespeare Company. But I'm getting to see oh, my daughter be with one now. <laughs> okay. Do you outline? Yes. Okay, so you know what you write about before. I love to outline because even if you don't go in that direction, if yeah. you wind up changing, you have something, you have a place to go, you have an idea of where it can take sure. you. And it will change, but I do, I do like so an outline you know the ending, Even if you don't go to yes, that ending? Yes, but it may change. It may change as it you're going, change. because okay. there may be better things happening, but you at least have a path that you can mm -hmm. go on. Okay. Do you uh, travel a lot abroad? Yeah, I, anytime I can. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, do people know you as well as they know you over here? Uh, I, do you have different receptions or different way people read your books? It, you know, it obviously depends on how you're traveling course, abroad. Yeah. I had a, a really fun experience going to Brighton for Brighton, um, England. Yeah. Brighton, UK, England. Yeah. Was part of horror writers, and I found out that accents do count, and that I don't say certain things well because I was meeting with the um, 
the, the young customs agent and she asked if I was here for business or pleasure and I said, oh no, I'm here for business. And she asked me what it was and I said that I was there for the horror writers convention and all of a sudden she turned around to her friend and she said, blimey Madge, could you imagine they have a convention for that? And I was kind of like, what? And she goes, they're having a whole convention. And I was like, no, 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 horror. 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 Yeah. I apparently don't say this word correctly, but anyway, so, yeah. it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and they were they were great. I'm assuming after 150 books or around that, somewhere you look back at your life and you have a perception of it, uh, what the journey has been, and you've achieved so much. So, what gets you excited those days? The grandkids or uh, little things? What's what's? Well, I'm what's hoping I eventually have grandkids. Okay. <laughs> I have little great nephews. Okay. I love them. Okay. I'm a diver. I still absolutely love to dive. I still, um, the same things. I'm still excited by a good book. I'm good still excited by a Broadway still, yeah. play. Um, I'm still excited to try. There's always something new. Um, I don't, I think that's the, probably the best gift maybe that we get is that part of living is essential to what you're doing because if you don't keep doing things, you're not fresh, you're not ready to, or for me, yeah. I know people work many different ways. Well, for me, talking to you, yeah, so, yeah. okay. There will be no crime unresolved in my district and jurisdiction. None whatsoever. And we're here to talk about your books, the Books of Spies, yeah, which yes. uh, has been out for a couple of years now. A couple now. of years yes. now, yes. And uh, what's happened since? Well, I'm working, of course, on another one okay, uh, that series? is a sequel okay. to this one, okay. yes, carrying on the same characters, uh, uh, um, a man named Judd Ryder who is retired military intelligence, and uh, the, the woman is Eva Blake who is a former um, uh, uh, curator of, of ancient manuscripts. And the card what kind of manuscript? Ancient manuscripts. Oh, ancient. Okay. And, and medieval, too. Okay. Uh, and the carnivore, who is a mysterious assassin who is now in book number four. This is. Okay. And uh, he's, he is so much fun to write about. Okay. The so man without a face. Nobody has ever really seen what he looks like. What he looks like, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's like uh, the. Uh, Louis XIV's uh, brother, the twin brother, who they put a still cast on his face for all his life. You know? Yes, and yes. Anyway. Um, but someday we will see. Well, someday we will see. Well, In a how many book. books do you have to wait for that? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe two more. Two more? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. not, not very really ambitious. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have to let the audience know that you're still writing the espionage. Yeah? Yes, spy novels. Spy, spy novels. Yes. We say the French way, espionage. Espionage. Okay. Uh, what interested you in that first? I was um, a, an editor at a think tank, okay. and I had top secret security clearance, and that kind of got me into that world. And there were mysterious okay. figures uh, with maybe only first names that passing was a place through. A, a place in D.C. or what was no, it? in California. In California, actually. okay. Yes. At the Cato Institute or some of those it places. It was called Tempo. It Tempo, was a okay. GE. Uh, military think tank, but of course part of the military Amazing. was very, very, uh, and we did very interesting things like we put water in the desert and then we put uh, missile silos in mountains, so it was quite a range. Mm. It was so fascinating because I had to punch numbers in every keypad for every door I went through. And I was always in trouble because I'd forget and leave papers on my desk. You know? But obviously you did not forget the information you read. I'm supposed to, put it, every time I walked out the door, I was supposed to put everything in a safe. And, and it was like, I want a drink of water. Can't I just go get, no. I was a bad girl. But I learned so much and it was so much fun to see. How long was that uh, period of your life? About three years. Three years, long enough to. Yeah and to make contacts. And, and from then you decided to become a writer? So that's a I was a journalism graduate, so I had been a reporter in Phoenix. I was a magazine editor. Mm -hmm. I had done just a lot of stuff. I wrote ad copy, but I'd always wanted to write novels. Okay. That was all I ever really wanted you to do. Do you feel any affiliation with the Matahari? Or <laughs> even though you have access to private information or secret information, the fact you've been going on for all those years about the same topic, it has to be something about you that Secretive? Well, 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 I don't know if that's what you say, but it's got to be something more uh, on the human level that must tie in. Right? That's a wonderful question. I don't think anybody has ever asked me that. So I think that, oh, I, I'm interested in power. 
And keeping secrets is a very powerful act. And just as people keep secrets that impact their entire families. From, from each other, yeah. husband and wife and... Everything. And sometimes they don't even realize they're keeping secrets. But governments do the same thing. And there becomes the question of how much secrecy do they really need to have. And they do need secrets, but that's part of their power. And the intelligence agencies are, in my opinion, the fourth leg of government because they are the resource for a lot of policy decisions that people don't realize. Uh, your, uh, what was your inspirations, uh, your influences when you started to write? Is it Robert Ludlum and... Uh, oh, I loved Ludlum. I okay. loved Forsyth. I Frederick loved Ian Forsyth, okay. Frederick Forsyth. I loved Ian Fleming, still do. Um, all of those, oh, Helen McGinnis, who what many people... What was it about them? Is this just uh, the, the, the story, the way it's written, the classiness? Or? I love adventure. Adventure, okay. I just love adventure. And because I, I am fundamentally a shy person, I can have adventures in my head without talking to anybody. <laughs> we were sitting in your panel yesterday. We were talking about the five rules of, for writing. Oh, you came to that. Yes. How nice. And uh, did you apply that to yourself? Yeah, I do. When I get stuck... Um, I didn't mention it there, but I'm always interested in the villain. If you don't know what, what the villain is doing in your story, you often don't know how to move the story forward. You often don't know how to figure out the plot. Sure, you need a strong uh, antagonist. You must have a believable, strong, worthy, a worthy antagonist. And I use the four rules about thinking about what, what does this character fear, mm -hmm. what does this character love, and what does this character want? What is this character willing to pay to get what he or she wants? This is what I wear when I go on vacation. But still, the hat makes a man, and the hats make the woman. Could crime be a standard of a finding order, insanity, a twisted mind, husband, cheating? Let me tell you, this book, for the first pick of the week, it's right on target. Travel daughter and twisted wife. Um, story from the trailblazers and domestic suspense. Uh, there are great short stories by a uh, now famous uh, writer that was not uh, so famous when those stories were written, especially after the end of World War II, like um, Patricia Highsmith, you know, that you know from Stranger on the Train, or uh, the talented Mr. Ripley, Joyce Harrington, or even Margaret Miller, and so many others. It's been edited by Sarah Wayman, and it's a great, fantastic read for the summer. Troubled Daughters and Twisted Wives. The next book is a bit a different tone. First book by someone called Emily Croy Barker. Um, big, thick book, as you can see. It's quite heavy as well. Uh, the Thinking Woman's Guide to Real Magic. It's a story of uh, Nora Fisher who goes to a friend's wedding and has a terrible time and is taking a little stroll in a garden, falls through a portal with only a copy of Pride and Prejudice in the back pocket. She meets a charming woman who takes her to a life of riches and decadence where things are going to happen to her. So is it a flip to reality or something the sanity is not quite there? Well, you have to find out to read this book. The Thinking Woman's Guide to Real Magic by Emily Croy Barker. The next book is quite something. I think I'm going to give you just uh, the short synopsis of it, you will understand why. The Husband's Secrets, Leanne Moriarty. The premise is very simple. Okay, imagine if your husband writes a letter to you uh, that to be opened only after his death. Imagine the letter contains all his darkest secrets, the deepest personal thoughts that could uh, devastate your life and the life of others. And imagine you stumble upon the letter when he's still very much alive. The Husband's Secret, I've said enough. Leanne Moriarty. And finally, our last book, which I kept for the last, if I was to say our favorite, she was our first on this show. Uh, MJ Rose, Seduction, talks about uh, the same character, Jack Littwell, her main protagonist, who is uh, deeply uh, grieved. And to relieve her grief, she decides to, to find the secret of a Celtic route. So she goes to Jersey, and when she's there, she meets a young man called uh, Theo Gaspar who has a different agenda. He wants her to help her find uh, the lost transcript of Victor Hugo's. I don't know if you know who Victor Hugo is, but he wrote The, the Miserable, 
and also he had two daughters, so he was a very fortunate writer, but a very unfortunate father. Both daughters had a very terrible fate. The first one drowned when she was 19, and that left him uh, grief stricken for very much the rest of his life. As the second one, Adult H, who maybe you have seen the True Force film, um, tells a story about uh, the second daughter who has been following this young soldier all around his uh, camp and was a victim of a sort of unrequited love, which left her pretty much uh, insane. Uh, but this book traces all the, um, the transcript from the seance Victor Hugo uh, did with uh, the shadow back then who tried to reconnect with his daughters. Fantastic book, great read, Seduction, N.J. Rose. And this concludes our very, very sane pick of the week. Do I look like a serious writer there?